You're listening to Natural Resources University. In this podcast network, our hosts are university researchers and extension specialists, opening your gateway to the science of natural resource management. Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Welcome back to Fire University, everybody. Uh, today, I have Sam Fullendorf and Bob Hamilton with me, and I'm pretty excited about this because uh, these folks are pretty far west from where I am out in Oklahoma, and I haven't talked to anybody out that far west yet, and I think they've got a, a lot of great research and a lot of great experience that they can bring to the podcast and, and uh, really wanted to pick their brain on on managing some plant communities that you may experience down in the southeast, but they certainly experience a lot of in prairie and uh, old fields and, and that sort of thing. So how's it going, Sam? It's good to see you. Very, very well. Glad to be here. Yeah. And uh, Bob, this is our first time meeting, but really glad to have you and definitely an impressive resume that you have uh, with all those acres burned. So we'll, we'll be excited to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, so, great. Thanks for the invite. So Sam, do you want to introduce everybody to, to who you are and what you do? Thanks, Marcus. I'm glad to be here. My name is Sam Fullendorf, and I'm uh, from Oklahoma State University. I work on sort of the interface between rangeland and wildlife. I'm originally from Texas, went to school at Angelo State University and Texas A&M. I uh, have been at Oklahoma State University for about 23 years. I've enjoyed uh, sort of thinking about grasslands from a private land standpoint, but also from conservation perspective. Yep. And uh, Bob, you want to tell us about yourself? Yeah, Marcus, I'm uh, Bob Hamilton. I, I work for the Nature Conservancy in Oklahoma. I'm stationed at our Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, about 40,000 acres, uh, kind of in the very northeast corner of Oklahoma sort of the southern, we're embedded within the southern end of the Flint Hills, which we'll, we'll probably touch on in terms of the significance of that, in terms of kind of the fire culture and, and what we're able to do with fire. Uh, but I'm the director of the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve. And so on the ground management, and then also uh, uh, land protection work and conservation planning for the region. Yeah, so you you get to set things on fire quite often. Yeah, huh? yeah. It's, it's a nice recreational sort of thing. Yeah, yeah I, I've carried a drip torch around for various mm -hmm. reasons, but a lot of fun doing that. Yeah. So uh, one of the reasons I, I really was excited about having you guys on is because of how much experience and, and uh, research you've done related to fire, the use of prescribed fire to manage plant communities, how fire interacts with her herbivory. I've done a fair amount of work with whitetail deer down in uh, the southeast related to that topic, but I think you guys have a really cool perspective and, and a really interesting research that, that has come out on this topic, just looking at the interaction between fire and herbivory and how important that interaction is in some of those prairie systems. So Sam, I was wondering if you wanted to to uh, talk about that a little bit with, I think it was it you that, that uh, coined pirate herbivory? Uh, it was me that coined pirate herbivory and it's and some people would claim that it's because I uh, was just trying to get some grant money, and that might be true. <laughs> but uh, but it's also uh, there. We were having a hard time. If you think from a researcher standpoint, when you say like something like fire grazing interactions, 
everyone thinks that you're talking about a statistical interaction. So you have fire, mm-hmm. you have grazing, you have fire and grazing. And so it's like it would be a just a uniform plot where fire and grazing occurs. So just I really struggled more communicating with other scientists than I did with the public <laughs> about it. And so I that's really the argument behind coining the the term pyric herbivory was to try and say that it's one process that's uh, more more about spatial interaction and we could give it our own definition and it wouldn't have so much baggage uh, yeah. from some people. So, so what is the definition of pyric herbivory then? Well, so the actual interpretation of the words, so pyric is formed by fire, and of course herbivory is grazing uh, or or browsing, and so so the 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 point is that uh, fire and grazing aren't independent, and they're tightly coupled, and that you can't talk about one without talking about the other, even though we've mostly spent most of our time trying to decouple them. So in other words, when we're studying fire and herbivory, we would have a treatment that is only fire and you don't let herbivores in. Uh, right. A treatment that's only herbivory and don't let fire in. Yeah. And in fact, it was even worse than that because out West, there were uh, agency policies that if you wanted to burn, you had to destock before you burned and you couldn't restock for two years after the burn. And if it burned from a wildfire, you couldn't allow grazing animals on it immediately after the burn. So oh, so still- even there, so you weren't even allowed to let them interact from a management standpoint. Right. So it was, it wasn't wow. just science, sciencey people trying to argue <laughs> about it, although that was a big part of it, but it was actually, uh, the fact that the the sort of culture of rangeland management was, you know, fire bad and we have to recover, let the system recover before we can graze it mm. associated with that. So and so I had I had a big interest in that and then the heterogeneity idea that, you know, just you need variability across the landscape in order to manage for different things and so forth. Yeah, I remember you uh, giving a talk in a symposium that I was hosting one time, and you used a word for that. What was that word? Heterogeneity? Is that the word? Or uh... No, there was a longer word, I think. that. Oh, phantasmagoria. <laughs> phantasmagoria. Right. Yeah, you know yeah. what? That, that actually was uh, the word of the day yesterday on my dictionary app. <laughs> <laughs> that's how that's actually how I got interested. I mean, that's how I found it is that I'm supposed my mother always told me that I had a really bad vocabulary. Oh. <laughs> she told me I should get dictionary.com to send me a uh a word, word of the day. day and then I should I, try to use it. And of course I just delete it all the time. One day Phantasmagoria came across and I thought, well, So so you really did find it. I was just kidding. I, I really did. <laughs> you I really, really did. did. I did. And that's hilarious. And so I, and I read it and it was, I don't remember the exact definition, but it's like a shifting series of stages or, and I was just like, that's what I'm trying to do. So, yeah. uh, so when you, uh, get, you gave a presentation at the wildlife society meeting that, uh, the title was phantasmagoria. Yeah. It's to, to try to spell it. that again. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. And it, it, I, as I like to joke, I, was going to I, the way I have envisioned it was that I was going to create a new discipline and it was going to be phantasmagoria ecology or something like that <laughs> and then I would be the father of phantasmagoria ecology yeah. never problem, did catch on. well I googled it and that word's already I think it was like a Marilyn Manson album and it's been used a lot so it wasn't original to me so maybe well, I was well. a little slow not that there's any, not that that music couldn't be a part of it, I guess. Yeah, that could be like the, the cover music of your, right, right, of your web page when you open it or something. That's, uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I know you've done a lot of research in that area. Is, I guess, when you're, Bob, when you've been working with Sam and you're trying to work out these, these questions with research, how, how much of an impact? has that made on the way that you do things, I guess, from, as you know, from the practitioner standpoint, when you're trying to conceptualize what you're going to do out in the prairie, you know, and manage those communities. I mean, how has this affected 
uh, your viewpoint and I guess your, your management techniques when you're trying to encourage, I guess, that interaction rather than separate them? Yeah, yeah, it's been an interesting evolution, I guess. Um, you know, I mean, working with the Nature Conservancy, of course, what, what we're trying to do with our properties is to support and maintain biological diversity. And in, and in these Great Plains systems, the recognition by grassland ecologists is that you know, grazing and fire were two of the primary forces that, that impacted this landscape and created it. You know, so you're both, thinking of it like a historical perspective. Yeah, kind of historical. historical. Yeah. Yeah, so you, you start with the kind of the soft, warm, fuzzy vision sort of stuff. Right, then, right. Uh, like you say, as a land manager or a practitioner, uh, where, where the torch hits the grass is the, is the interesting part of, yeah, how, how do you bring that to, to life now? Right. Uh, the pre-settlement vision, you know, is, yeah, we had this just helter skelter sort of landscape fires happening all different times of the year, Native American set fire, lightning strike fires, uh, right. pat patches being from, you know, the size of your living room to Nebraska, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and just this, this very uh, unfettered, like I say, uh, shifting landscape patch mosaic is, is right. kind of a, a phantasmagoria I think is there you go yeah 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 <laughs> but, but how you how you make that in, in how do you make that happen in terms of a managed system is is a little more challenging you know uh, as a fire practitioner we we are using prescribed fire of course um, we have to be able to manage that that force uh, you just can't throw matches and let her go I've had people ask me that you know <laughs> yeah. well, you just throw matches on a windy day and just see what happens well, that, that, that's tough on the career, you know, that, no, yeah. can't, can't really do that. You get one of those, right? Yeah. And, and Folks frown upon that. <laughs> yep. Yep. So how we manage fire, how we put fire back in spatially, you know, where, where it happens and temporarily when it happens in terms of the different seasons of fire, uh, that's where it gets, uh, I think, elegant, kind of this, this, yeah. um, it's a good way to put it. Play. Yeah. And then you throw grazers on top of that, of course. And, and that resulting heterogeneity or, or patchiness out there on the landscape uh, has proven in, in our situation here anyway, we've, uh, most of this work being done by Oklahoma State, but we're up around 200 scientific publications that have come off the preserve over the last almost 30 years. Wow. It all, all seems to be telling us this, this heterogeneity focus in terms of trying to maintain a very patchy shifting sort of landscape that that's working very well for us in terms of you know our currency being biological diversity so um, yeah so i think our, our partnership with oklahoma state especially has has brought a uh, and you can tell from sam this refined more sophisticated approach i mean that that's what he's all about right he's a, yeah, a sophisticated, sophisticated gentleman yeah <laughs> um, but kind of this deeper understanding and appreciation um for we're trying to manage those that the, the whole grazing fire interaction so it's it's kind of it's an ongoing process of course yeah both of you you keep bringing up shifting mosaic and heterogeneity so for our listeners who are trying to envision what that looks like what what are you talking about from the i guess if we were if we took one management unit what is it what is that uh, look like within that unit and then if you broke up the property let's say into 10 units how how does the heter heterogeneity and mosaic play into those those uh two scales i guess of, of influence well i i guess i can start but bob could uh could pile in uh, at any point um so early on i was trying to learn all I could about wildlife and plants and everything and fire. And I remember uh, seeing an early paper, I think it was from the seventies that uh, talked about the kind of habitat you have to make to make grassland bird habitat. And, and basically for some of the birds, you know, you had to have tall grass and for some of the birds, you had to have short grass, you had to have bare ground, you had to have different structures depending on. So early on, I, I remember being, struggling with that and thinking well why in the well i guess you just can't have all of it you know right there's always winners and losers you gotta pick yeah. one and then of course if if you think about it even more you can carry that out further and say well you can actually have them all you just have to have variability out there that's managed somehow right and 
then you have what Bob was describing, how these landscapes may have operated historically. And so all of that built up to what Bob was actually already practicing, but we decided to try and put some data to with the help of GPS collars and things like that uh, and, and collect data on biodiversity as well. But the idea that these animals are actually, the grazing animals are seriously attracted to recently burned areas, particularly bison and cattle. Uh, so, so when you b burn basically all of the herbivores are going seeking out the burned areas, what you're saying? Yeah. And in fact, the, the rangeland culture was such that uh, people were anti-fire because they'd seen wildfires occur. And then the animals would congregate on those and just abuse it. And it yeah. looked like it just never recovered from the fire, but it was largely, so it created a culture where if part of a pasture burned, you were either supposed to fence it off or burn the whole pasture or just completely destock it. Right. And so we carried that knowledge and sort of asking, well, if that's where the animals like to graze and we need to get fire on the landscape anyway, maybe we can use fire and get the animals attracted to a burned area. They heavily graze that burned area, but there's other parts of the pastures they actually avoid. And you grow mm -hmm. up a lot of grass, that helps all the species that need a lot of uh, biomass. And, and it just sort of moves around the pasture. Now it's different than a rotational grazing system because it's a lot of years in between uh, it being heavily grazed, whereas mm -hmm. a traditional rotational grazing might be a matter of weeks or months uh, before the animals get back to a patch. And so you're trying to get this variability where you have an area that's been heavily grazed and recently burned and an area that hasn't been burned or grazed for several years and then everything in between. And Bob had sort of initiated that on, on the, uh, the bison unit. And, uh, and then Bob and I got together, uh, with some others and started talking about, well, how can we translate that into, uh, a principle to discuss from an ecological perspective? And then in addition, how could we come up with management ways that we could help landowners actually manage their land? So there's a lot of what Bob does that isn't exportable to the general public. Right. So right. to try and find some things that might be, I don't know, Bob, do you, yeah. did I leave anything? Yeah, out? yeah. We never, um, we never thought our whole fire bison interaction unit, we never, we never thought that concept or that model was going to be real exportable to, especially the private landowners around us. You know, right. most ranchers aren't, interested in switching to bison. I mean, it's a little little different market, a little bit different handling. Mm -hmm. and, and probably, you know, the way we're using fire, all different seasons, uh, you know, it's it's a, a little bit of a pointy headed, you know, exercise to try to put Humpty back together as I think of it in terms of uh, <laughs> the original disturbance regime. Right. So, so yeah, getting together with with Sam and, and Dave Engel was of course a, a big part of the whole thing, but yeah, some of these, these great thinkers out of OSU, as, as Sam mentioned, you know, then the conversation became, yeah, what, what have we learned from kind of the fire bison model? How can we, how can we come up with, with uh, models to manage domestic livestock more creatively to maybe mm -hmm. get more uh, habitat diversity out there on the landscape to support biological diversity? And that's where, where uh, Sam and others have, have coined the, the patch burn grazing. Yeah, patch burn grazing. I wanted to get to that. So yeah, essentially yeah. what you're saying is now the idea is, okay, they're not necessarily gonna have bison, but there are plenty of, of folks that have, have cattle, right? Uh, right? Probably almost every landowner out, out right. that way. Right. Yeah. So the idea is that you could use fire and the cattle together to sort of mimic what used to happen with, with, uh, with fire right. and bison. Right. right. And, and in fact, you know, so Bob, they do, they, you know, the bison unit at the Tallgrass Prairie Preserve, it has random fire, uh, or at least if, if it'll burn. So in the fire unit, it's real, real, real messy. So, mm -hmm. and, and that's what, what, that's what makes it really cool. Um, but, but the, 
but you start thinking of telling a landowner, oh, just go light something on fire and see what happens, you know, and, uh, and <laughs> just uh, pit, pitch matches out on windy days. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so we, we started trying to think, and we are still thinking about that. Well, what parts can you throw away and still get most of the benefit? Um, and there's a lot of really interesting, uh, things. Some of them we thought would happen and some of them we didn't think would happen when we started doing this and some you know are like when you get into drier rangelands they have a problem if you graze you can't burn and because they don't accumulate fuel but if you don't yeah. burn the places where the animals are even though it's all in one pasture then you've actually overcome this sort of fire fuel paradox and you've actually mm -hmm. you can have both or, or fuel forage pa paradox i guess yeah and, and so it's it's kind of like uh, all of a sudden you and, and it, it sort of makes me argue that if you're in a fire dependent system, that's going to be grazed. The thing we should be talking about is how to make that part of one unified management strategy instead of two separate discussion topics that mm -hmm. bump into each other every now and then. And you have to figure out how to make them work. Right. So when you. So when you burn and you remove all that vegetation and then plants start re-sprouting or, or germinating in that, in that flush of green, that's what the, the herbivore, which regardless of which one it is, is attracted to, right? So right. Why, are, why are they attracted to that? Is, is it the plants are actually higher quality? Yeah. So uh, crude protein, for example, is like four times higher on a recently burned. Four pack. times. Um, wow. Okay. Yeah depending on the time of year. Uh, but, uh, and then, but there's other benefits that we never imagined. So like uh, animals that have access to a burn patch that forage on that uh, have lower tick loads. Oh, so and, parasites are right, wiped right. out, yeah. So there's a lot of little things that, so it's kind of hard since we can't ask the bison why he's grazing there. Or, well, uh, let me ask you this, Sam, if I, if I uh, put your favorite meal on a table uh-huh well let's say i have your favorite meal two plates one uh -huh. of them is twice the size of the other one you normally would pick that but if it was on a plate this on a table full of ticks you'd probably still take the smaller steak i'm guessing or whatever i, I, I think i would it depends on how hungry i am but yeah. <laughs> yeah i could i can see that that uh line of reasoning why they might avoid the uh, sure. tick infested area Sure. And, yes. and, you know, and some of those things we, we didn't necessarily think about early on and you just think, well, wow, we got these animals in and there's no ticks on them or, you know. Yeah. Uh, just like a G whiz thing that happened yeah. and you realize you need to study it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you have to call somebody that actually knows something about ticks all of a sudden. <laughs> or, yeah. I've actually had to do that about ticks myself. So <laughs> yeah, right. Call right. Somebody. <laughs> yeah. So that's really interesting. And I guess, uh, it, so the quality of the vegetation and then, and then, uh, other benefits like not getting infested with parasites obviously make it a very attractive area. But what you were saying earlier with the biomass, what is that traditionally what people were using to, to measure quality, I guess, like this pasture is great because there's more biomass there yeah so from, from the cattle perspective it's it's curious because what they would argue uh, traditionally is that most everyone knew that low biomass was high quality and that high mm. biomass was low quality uh but they assumed that it was sort of a more linear relationship and we actually studied that mm -hmm. and brady allred a former student of mine he found that basically it's a relationship that's almost like the shape of the graph. You know, yeah. basically if you have zero biomass, then you have really high quality forage. If you get much more than zero, then it gets really low, really fast. Yeah. So plants and, grow and, and mature really quickly. Yeah. And so the challenge really was that sort of made me think, well, well, so the old way of arguing was, well, then, you don't want the vegetation to get too rank or it won't be high quality. So you're trying to get it in the middle. 
but that's mm -hmm. because they didn't appreciate heterogeneity. So if you actually yeah. realize that you can have patches, if, if you have, they can get quantity from one patch and get quality from another patch. So they can even mix their diet some. Uh, okay, so like if you burned a, a, a pasture and it's heterogeneous, like you're saying, basically you'd have the fire sort of meander through it and you'd have unburned patches or you may intentionally do that. I guess, Bob, you right. can even put fire breaks in place to to make sure that fire doesn't get into some areas or how Bob are you? Bob can make fire breaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we, we can just manage fire. We can bend it to our will. No, yeah. no. But, but yeah, I mean, typically when we're talking patch burn grazing, uh, how you implement it on the ground with cattle, usually you what you do is you take a pasture, whatever size unit you're dealing with, break it into thirds or fourths or whatever increments you, you so desire. <clears throat> and those are fixed burn units then. So most of the work, well, we've, I guess we, Sam can get in this. We've, we've experimented on the preserve with, you know, from complete burn, complete burning of pastures, you know, you burn the whole pasture, mm -hmm. up breaking a pasture into eight different cells or eight different units, and then and then this is managed with with uh, with cattle grazing um, in a more regimented fashion. But yeah, typically you have with cattle grazing anyway, you have fixed burn units, um, and you rotate those. It's it's through the seasons or through the years, depending on what you're doing. Um, but kind of fixed controllable type units. The difference being, like as Sam mentioned in, in our bison unit, it's much more of a helter skelter uh, fluid sort of system where it's uh, much more of a random, uh, I think of it as kind of designed chaos is, is how we're, or managed chaos. That sounds managed chaos. Managed chaos, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no. some, of, some of the ranchers that have applied it, you know, they'll just use roads. So sometimes their pat, burn patch is really big. Yeah. Sometimes it's really small. And, and we're as and it's been hard to translate to the public because some of our research sites, when we started, we made the patches all the same size and uh, and it looked like it was really difficult to do because everyone sort of interpreted that that means you have to go out there and have square patches that are all the, the same size. But right. uh, but over time, we've gradually found that there's actually quite a bit of slop in the uh, uh yeah and in, in the pr process you don't have to have exactly the same size and right. shape. when in fact it sounds like to me it's preferable that you don't right. have the the same sizes yeah. or uh you don't necessarily have them even on the f same fire regimes right you right. may mix up how long since fire and whether or not their cows have an excess right right exactly and you know i i mean the point if you think if the bison were in charge of the burn program instead of Bob, how would they burn? Yeah. And, uh, you know, they'd have to, first of all, have thumbs, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You never know. I, I guess <laughs> I shouldn't, but, but they, you know, you kind of get the image that they would like to be burning a little something almost every day. Yeah. And, uh, which I think would be cool if we could rig that up where they could pull that off, Bob. <laughs> oh man. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You yeah, can you're rig it up, up Sam. You can break it up. Yeah. You could get like a little saddle that sits yeah. on top with fuel and then their <laughs> tail and kind of drip maybe it out around. Get like a monkey to ride on the, uh, <laughs> on the back. <laughs> yeah. That, that, that would, that would attract some attention at least. Yeah. So, uh, one thing that, you know, being someone from the South, it's really easy for me to visualize what heterogeneity in plant communities looks like in Florida or, you know, in, in another state that's forested. But it's it's a little bit more difficult from if I'm thinking about prairie mm -hmm. for me to think about that. So when you're talking about heterogeneity and structure where I mean, there's nothing that's over what shoulder height at a maximum even right in the yeah, tall grass prairie and that's rare so right. I mean, there are some shrubs but but for the most part you're talking about mo the majority of the biomass is you know less than a meter uh and uh and so it's it a waist higher or lower yeah and so you're creating and and you know we i've even done some work in short grass prairie where you're talking the heterogeneities between 
uh, six inches and and you know zero. Six instead. inches and zero. Yeah. And, then, and so when you're talking about diversity and and uh, whoever wants to respond to this, please feel free. But let, let's say we're in a system where we have the difference. The heterogeneity is all generated between zero and a foot tall. That that is having a tremendous effect on which wildlife species are using it, or which insects. What what is driving the biodiversity changes that you're seeing between those two? Bob, good. Well, I, I uh, was like Sam. You you alluded to it. I mean, even in short grass prairie, um, just those what we think are pretty minuscule differences in biomass and height um, amplified a little bit more in the tall grass, of course, but especially for for some of our native wildlife, like our grassland nesting birds, boy, they are really keyed in onto biomass levels. They don't, they don't care so much about the composition, you know, in terms of the, what species they're nesting in. Mm -hmm. so it's primarily the, the structure. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of research out there showing uh, during the breeding season and, and in the off season, in the dormant season during the winter time, um, the grassland nesting birds that we have here, boy, they are really keyed into those to that variability in, in biomass and you'll have starkly different species on different patch types. And so again, if you, if you want all these native, all of our native brethren to come along for the ride in terms of the, you know, providing them a, a template to persist uh, mm -hmm. as a land manager, that's the challenge is that is to maintain all these different patch types all the time. Right. Yeah, we, so if we take one bird species, that bird is actually choosing different levels within that matrix for different Correct. things for different habitat Correct. components yeah okay yeah. and yeah. you know what bob and i like to say that birds aren't botanists you know they're not yeah. out there <laughs> ID. they're actually although we come back and often for our bug friends say that bugs are botanists yeah. uh so yeah. species do matter for some things but for birds it's really just the structure and they'll key and and it it, to somebody from outside, it looks fairly subtle. But for those of us that work in the system, you know, I'm not a very good bird identifier, but I can tell you what birds are going to be there because we've studied them and the habitat it sort of dictates it all. Right. But yeah. the, other, the, the other related point that I think sometimes I forget to relay because it's where I'm from and the background I have coming through the rangeland discipline. The other point about that is that one of the principles of managing rangelands is to make it homogenous. Yeah. And it's so, by design. You want it to be. Yeah. Um, you don't want anything too disturbed or anything undisturbed. You want everything to be really lightly disturbed. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it's really difficult to translate to the community because they've basically been told that the opposite of what we're telling them now is what they should be managing for. And, and then, mm -hmm. you know, and there were some reasons for that. It's not like they were just totally wrong. It's just right. that things have changed and people so, are interested in stuff they weren't, they weren't interested in. Yeah. So that, that would be like a, a high input yeah. system where the, the traditional, I mean, we, I see that down in, and uh, the deep south as well, where yeah. you know that's the idea is to have improved pasture grasses, and uh, you know you have stocking rates and and other inputs that are going into that system. But what I wanted to, I guess, pivot off that a little bit and and think about is, okay, they were told to do it that way for a reason. That's a very effective model to produce meat for you know beef or or whatever. Uh, what about what you're talking about with this patch burn grazing? How does that compare in terms of the productivity from the beef cattle standpoint? If somebody, if a landowner is managing cattle, but also has an interest in, in diversity or, or a wildlife. So, so when, when we first started this, I think one of our intent, at least the way I thought of it was that, well, I was pretty sure it was going to be the right thing to do for conservation of mm -hmm. For things and then I thought well we ought to be measuring weight gain so that we can record how much we hurt that so that you know if, right if we, you know, <laughs> that, and, yeah, and how much we, did we lose and what we found is that rarely well I, I don't 
very rarely did we ever hurt uh, animal performance. And quite often we improved it. And it sort of depends on what you compare it to. So in Bob's part of the world, some of the uh, local management is burn everything every year and double stock it early. And then you get off it and grow more grass so that you'll be able to burn it again. And, and it, and the truth is when that works, you can't get more weight gain than that. So, so in that, in that model, you're actually burning the same pasture twice. In the, no, you, burn, in the, you just burn it every year. So once okay. a year. Every spring. Every spring. Every spring. Yeah. I got you. And yeah. then, and then when it works, it's, it's as good as it gets, but, but, the problem is when it doesn't work, you lose a lot of money because you've got mm -hmm. a lot of animals out there. And it, and so if you, and so what we found in that case was that when it works well, we can't gain as much weight by burning patches, mm -hmm. but when it doesn't work, we gain just as much as we did as, you know, there's no relationship between rainfall and how much weight gain we get. So you get a flat line. Whereas with, the more intensive management is highly dependent upon rainfall. So the patch burn grazing model, if I'm hearing you correctly, is much safer from right. year to year variation in rainfall right. or whatever. And if you compare it to a place where they don't burn at all, then you actually get increased weight gain because the forage yeah. quality is higher. So, right, right. So, so that's, uh, I don't know, what is that, Bob? Probably the better part of 20 years of research that sort of goes into that conclusion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and I think I can, just to add a little bit to that, I think what you're doing with, with patch burn grazing is, yeah, by not putting all your eggs in one basket, so to speak, mm -hmm. or cattle in one basket. I, I, yeah, yeah. The metaphors are a little clunky. Prairie chicken. Good size basket. No, prairie chicken in one basket, yeah. Yeah, you're you're hedging, and so you get uh, what can happen in this part of the world is yeah, either you get a droughty situation, it'll turn dry, and you just don't get that the regrowth just does not come on as aggressively from that freshly burned grass, and or you'll get a real cold spell. So we'll have a week, ten days where the sun doesn't come out; it's just wet, cold, rainy, and those warm season grasses. That's what you're trying to stimulate with that that real early spring burning. You're trying to kickstart you know, the blue stem grasses and the switch grass and Indian grass, uh, but they just, they just kind of go into torpor because the soil temperature goes down, you know, their photosynthetic rates goes down. So, and you've just doubled the number of cattle you normally have out there. And so they, they get to where they're locally, they'd say, you know, they start chewing on each other's tails. So, um, <laughs> and if with that double stock system, you only have 90 to 100 days to put on your gains. So typically the cattle are introduced in mid-April they leave mid July, so you're you're shoving all your chips into that one that one bet, <clears throat> and if you have a little bit of like Sam says, if you have a little meteorological challenge, ooh boy, you know they start going backwards pretty quickly in terms of their rate of gain, and uh, you can lose a lot of money fast, or you can make a lot of money fast, just depending right. on you know and, how and, shake out. And you know, early on, Marcus, I mean, actually the way you asked this question was you said one unit and then what if you had 10, 10 uh, pastures or, re, you know, right, right. manage. That's sort of my interpretation of that part of the world. Well, it makes sense that since you can make a lot of money doing what they're talking about doing, that you might want to do that on some pastures sometimes. Mm. But you probably don't want to do it everywhere to hedge your bet. So, right. so, so basically you'd have patchiness within a pasture, but then you would have patchiness across pastures. And, yeah. Uh, so you'd have a, I, th I think the, uh, what, the literature from Australia calls it a, an invisible mosaic versus a, an yeah. actual mosaic. Yeah. <clears throat> so you have one mosaic that's actually created by the way that fire is spreading in the system but a secondary mosaic that we have more control of is where you put the fire yeah based right. on which burn unit but okay. it, but it is it, they are confounding challenges because like you know so the traditional focus of rangeland conservation was build more and more fence and make smaller and smaller pastures well that that just makes it that much harder to have fire and grazing interacting mm -hmm. uh, because you can't if you have 
20,000 acres and you need to burn a third of it a year to keep woody plants out and it's divided up into a hundred paddocks you know it's really hard to figure out how to burn that third you can't burn a third of all the pastures because yeah. you know so so it, i think I, and and there are some ranchers that have been taking fences out and making pastures bigger so they can do this so oh, i got you interesting to watch. so uh most of the listeners i think are are uh generally at least based on the feedback that i get interested in wildlife and uh, thinking about that and uh, uh i think we've covered that pretty well that in general this increasing heterogeneity uh is really good for wildlife but what about for some of those that are that are uh less interested in bird watching but more interested maybe in in uh, some of the consumptive uses so how how are some of those species affected like deer and turkeys and and i guess you have grouse and quail there as well bob's the chicken expert <laughs> uh, we we have in this part of the world we have the greater prairie chicken is our our uh, our native grouse and uh they're interesting because they are a year-round resident they don't they don't migrate so the chickens that we have in the neighborhood they are here you know, 24 seven. And what we found, you know, historically, I mean, when I took wildlife management 101, what you learned was, you know, prairie chickens had tremendous site fidelity in terms of where they do their reproductive, all their, their displays, the booming grounds, uh, where the males come to do their dancing and show off for the girls and, and the females trickle in, you know, for breeding. And the conventional wisdom was those sites, th those were those were hardwired on the landscape and those chickens kind of had their own internal GPS and they would come back to that, that lick location, that, that mm -hmm. booming ground year after year. Well, yeah, under conventional management, that's, that's the way it works. Um, but what we found on the preserve is with this shifting landscape patch mosaic, this where we're moving patches around that short structure. I mean, part of what the, the males are selecting for is patches that had very minimal residual cover when they're mm -hmm. doing their they're booming in the early spring they actually start in the fall kind of practicing and you know you can't show off for the girls in that big grass and so you've never seen a chicken do that but i've seen a turkey do that yeah yeah so you got to have the right <laughs> dance stage you know to show your yeah. stuff and so what we found is um uh as you might expect them with the shifting patchiness of the landscape the lex move with that 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 patchiness and so it's it's a much more under, under a different management regime that we think is kind of maybe sort of approximating you know that original system uh the chickens are acting in a, in a much different fashion so mm, that's really interesting yeah so and and they're they're an interesting species because within several months especially during their reproductive cycle they need very different patch types so those females what we've found and this is a lot of work that that sam and his students have done with especially with prairie chickens and grassland birds uh, so Sam, correct me, <laughs> but the, it, my recollection is the females where a, where a hen comes in to breed, uh, she typically 95% of the time or so, she will nest within about a two kilometer radius of that point. Yeah. And so as a land manager, the challenge is then, okay, where are you providing nesting cover? Uh, she's not going to want to nest in that real short profile patch. She needs covers. They're ground nesting birds, of course, about the size of a football. So typically what those hens are looking for is patches on the landscape that have several years of uh, residual thatch, you know, a lot, a lot of good cover. Then once the, once her clutch hatches, a lot of times apparently that, that real thick nesting cover that the hens select for in terms of the nesting phase, apparently a lot of times that's too, too thick for the, for the little chicks, the little puff balls yeah. to, to be able to effectively navigate. And they, they, uh, they need, really good access to bugging. They've got to be mm -hmm. able to get, especially grasshoppers, very, fairly quickly for both protein and moisture. And so if they're in a patch that has really thick vegetation, they'll, they'll just get exhausted and die. Mm. So times immediately after they're all hatched, the hen takes them to a patch that's one or two years post disturbance that has a lot of forbs, a lot of broadleaf plants, yeah, like a little a bit of, of cover, you know, overhead mm -hmm. cover, like a little miniature forest probably some cover from aerial predators, but also from the elements. And so that's where the chicks do real well you know, in terms of having better bugging access through the vegetation. So, so chickens are telling us 
you know, as a land manager, if you want to effectively manage for chickens, you have to manage, you have to provide this heterogeneity or patching right. of the landscape. Well, that's a, that's an interesting way, I think, to, to boil it down. It, it's not that the heterogeneity is increasing biodiversity. That's, that's one thing that happens, but that heterogeneity is also needed by an individual species. Right, right. right. Just, uh, you know, having proximate uh, availability of these different types of structure in that system mm-hmm. is pretty important. And I, I, I talk about the same kinds of things in, in uh, the deep south and forested systems, how important that heterogeneity is. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I talk about deer and turkeys all the time because the, the uh, folks that, that I'm talking to normally are interested in those species. And then uh, more and more since I've moved to Florida, uh, they're interested in quail as well, but it's really interesting to hear that perspective essentially shared, it sounds like, by uh, you guys and the way you think about the chickens. Well, and and it, it works for the others. I mean, you already know this, but it works for the others too, but it's not always heterogeneity driven by fire and grazing. So sometimes it may be less about the the pirate herbivory, but it's still a focus on heterogeneity and it may be sort of how much brush is in an area mm-hmm. or whether you, whether you have big trees around. And, and that's what makes it really exciting for, uh, for looking at large conservation areas is it, it's one thing if all you had to do was manage for white tailed deer, mm-hmm. you know, that that's pretty, I mean, it's not, not easy, but it's not horribly difficult. Not compared to managing for 50 species. Yeah, you start throwing <laughs> a few more species in and then yeah. all of a sudden you start to get bigger area and you have to have roost sites for turkeys, right, right. but you can't have sites that chickens avoid because they don't like those big trees. And so um, and so some of that, I don't know, I'm sure you may have seen the paper we had by Evan Tanner, even just mm-hmm. looking at quail surviving bob whites surviving the winter and summer heat and cold they use different yeah. habitats and right you know, and they're moving those. around yeah I, so I think that that's been really cool work and uh would love to talk to you in depth about that at some point but the thermal heterogeneity stuff yeah. where we're just creating different microclimates for giving animals the opportunity to choose to get out of the heat i mean i get under a you know i, I live in florida Sure. And uh, it gets hot down here. Sure. And sometimes I want to get under a tree to get in the shade, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. And uh, you're you're basically taking that concept out there and thinking about that as a resource, having yeah. shade or you know. Yeah. And if if they if, if they put a GPS collar on you, you might not use that tree <laughs> very often. But, but when, when you I do, use, it's important. Really important. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. Well, uh, I think this has been great, guys. Really eye-opening to to get your perspective on things, and and uh, I think a lot of the concepts translate pretty well to folks that have forested systems, or maybe if they're particularly if they have old fields or something down down in this part of the world. I actually grew up in the Black Belt Prairie, so yeah. I can relate to it a little bit from that. But sure. that's really interesting to get that, and I, I really appreciate you guys coming on and and uh, talking to the listeners been a, a great time yeah glad to do it yeah uh, a lot of fun y'all yeah. need to come out and see the great american prairie yeah 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 <laughs> I, I agree yeah. <laughs> yeah great well thanks marcus yeah, yeah. thank you yeah. very much we appreciate it Our university is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab. Natural Resources University is funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. New episodes are released every Tuesday. For more information, follow us on our social media platforms at nr underscore university. Mm-hmm.